Hey everyone, it's a heck of a nice day for late October, so you get to record the lecture from outside again, that's pretty cool. No bees this time since it was cold, and now they're all dead and I'm not, so that's pretty good. Today we're going to talk about integral theorems, so that would be the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem within the context of this class. And that'll be the end of our discussion of vector and tensor calculus, so we'll move on to kinematics next lecture. There are a number of useful theorems relating the integrals of derivatives of scale or vector and tensor fields over regions to the integrals over the boundary of that region of the scalar vector and tensor quantities themselves. <coughs> so here, well, region R is going to be a subset, or all of, a three-dimensional Euclidean space. And the region itself is also three-dimensional when we talk about a region. So we'll say a region called R is a subset or equal to Euclidean three-dimensional space <coughs> is a three-dimensional subset. And it has some volume. So in other words, we're talking about, you know, sections of Euclidean space that are shaped nicely enough that it makes sense to talk about them having a volume. <coughs> so you're not going to be talking about, I don't know, some cantor set or something that there would be in real analysis or some non-measurable thing. It's a nice smooth subset of Euclidean space. Um, and if it's not all of the space, then it'll have a boundary that is itself smooth. So if R is not equal to all, of three-dimensional Euclidean space, and R is a subset, then there is a surface that is called its boundary. Two-dimensional. We'll call it dr. Um, so this doesn't mean it's a partial derivative of anything. That's just the notation that they use. And that separates r from the rest of Euclidean space that is not r. So we'll say that's its complement in E3. <coughs> if, um, if the volume of R is finite, then the surface of R has to be a closed surface. So if the volume is infinite, then it could be, say, the 
all points x, y, and z with z greater than zero or, you know, some infinite quadrant, then the surface isn't necessarily closed. Um, but if the volume is finite, then its boundary has to be a closed surface. At any point in the boundary of R, there is an outward unit normal, which will denote n hat, um, at least any point where the boundary is smooth. So at a corner, there's not necessarily an outward unit normal, but we're going to only be concerned with regions that are regular enough that, you know, there might be some edges like on a cube, but the whole thing isn't an edge like some sort of space filling curve or some nastiness, we're going to assume that everything is at least piecewise smooth. All right. A surface, which will denote S for now, is going to be a subset of Euclidean three-dimensional space that has dimension of two. So it has area, but it doesn't have volume. <clears throat> At any point where the surface is smooth enough, there's going to be two possible choices for unit normal, where um, you know the the choices are the opposite of one another. You know, so it could point out or in. You could think. We have n1 is equal to minus n2. Let's clean that up a little bit. If s is the boundary of some bounded region R, then the sign of N, you know, which, which one we choose, is given by the orientation induced on S by the region that it is bounding. Namely, you pick the one that is the outward normal for the surface that it's bounding.
or rather for the region that it's bounding. The boundary of a surface, if it has one, is a curve. Um, but if a surface is the boundary of a finite you know, region, then it won't have a boundary. For instance, if you look at the surface of a beach ball, it doesn't have a boundary. Um, but if you were to cut the beach ball into two hemispheres, then each of them would have a boundary curve. All right, so let's kind of draw some examples here. And we'll draw a lot of things like these in continuum mechanics. A good continuum mechanics potato. This is uh, just any general <coughs> region of space. So we'll call this one R, which is a subset of E3. And its boundary is dr, and it has volume. Vol r is greater than 0. All right, so this is r here, and its boundary is dr. And if we look at a point on the surface, Then there is here's a point X in the boundary, and here is N of X, the unit normal. <coughs> so we'll denote differential volumes. dv, differential scalar areas as dA, and differential area normal vectors as n hat dA. So here, n hat is the unit normal. All right, so as I had mentioned earlier, if we have the boundary of a finite region, then that boundary here, dr, doesn't itself have a curve comprising its boundary. Um, but if we split it into two halves, by some closed curve, which we'll call C, then each of those, you know, halves of R, of DR rather, would have a boundary. So let's do that. So we have our, uh, ooh, can I do that? No, it's not gonna work. So we have our region here. Well, let's split it in half by, or at least into two. Sections, so here is a closed curve C. This here thing is the boundary of R. So C is a curve that's entirely in the boundary of R and it's closed. Um, so it splits it into, we'll say, one surface, S1, 
and another surface S2. Okay, well now each of these two surfaces has a boundary, and that boundary can be identified with the curve C, but if we keep the unit normal to those surfaces as the outward unit normal for dr, right, so dr, um, the direction of the normal is specified by the fact that it's bounding r, but for each of these two half surfaces here, they don't actually bound any region of space um, because they have this hole in the middle. We'll draw them separately to make that a little more obvious. But, um, all right, so let's uh, draw S1 here. So we have like something like that. And That's not quite exact, but it's close enough, I guess. <coughs> S1. <coughs> All right, and so here is, again, C. Well, if we look at any point here, we have N. The unit normal is outward. Um, so the fact that the unit normal goes that way, if you think of the right-hand rule and how the unit normal goes, it uh, sort of follows that you have to go around the curve in this direction for it to be a positively oriented surface, right? So then your unit tangent to the curve, say dx, I guess we can get a different color to make that a little more clear. Call it dx, the vector, but it goes from this way to that way, um, and not the other way around, because that would be the one, you know, that's the way you traverse it with the right-hand rule that um, you're going around in the way that's compatible with the unit normal to the surface. Now, um, if we look at S2, you'll find that its unit normal kind of points more in the downward direction, so we would have to traverse C in the opposite sense for the orientation to be compatible. And this is, uh, it comes into play when you're talking about Stokes theorem with your curl and you know the the flux through a surface equaling the line integral around its boundary sort of thing which we'll get to in a minute but let's draw s2 here something like that and again, here's C, but now we have the unit normal going that way. And so it follows that we have to go around C in that sort of sense. So now that is our unit tangent goes in the opposite direction if it's positively oriented. <coughs> the textbook gives a uh, more precise definition of what it means for something to be positively oriented, namely it involves the cross product of the unit tangent to the curve at two different points and that having positive inner product with the uh, the unit normal at any other point on the surface, um, but you don't really need to know that precise of a definition for any reasonably shaped thing. It's going to be pretty obvious which one is properly handed. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
So now that we've established what we mean by surfaces, boundaries, curves, regions, and all that, we can get on to the theorems themselves. Um, we'll start with the divergence theorem. Well, that didn't work out that well, huh? Right, there are three relations that we'll call the divergence theorem within the context of this class. So for R, a bounded region with boundary dr, there'll be this. Uh, first, the integral over the boundary of any scalar field that's differentiable everywhere on R, phi times n, the outward unit normal, dA, is equal to the integral over all of R of grad phi times the differential volume. The second will be for a vector field the integral over the boundary of the vector field dot the differential area is equal to the integral over R of the divergence of the vector field. And the third is for a tensor field. The integral over the boundary of a tensor field acting on the differential area normal is equal to the integral over the region of the divergence of the tensor field. Okay, next we'll establish some... So those are the three that would be called the divergence theorem. And of course it requires that your scalar, vector, or tensor field be differentiable over the entire region of interest, or these would fail to be the case. <coughs> Line integrals. Alright, so let's say that we have a scalar field phi and a vector field v defined on some region R, which has volume, and let's say that we have a curve C contained entirely in that region where phi and V are defined. Oops. 
Well, we can parameterize the curve C by a single scalar variable, lambda. That word's not going to fit there, huh? Maybe it would have. Sure, that works. So we'll say C is equal to the set of points x hat of lambda. So x hat is a you know, function that maps the interval lambda in uh, the closed interval from lambda naught to lambda 1. So x is a, a specified function from that interval to Euclidean space um, and it defines a curve which is C. Alright, so if everything is differentiable if uh, phi v c x of lambda are all differentiable then um, we have that phi evaluated at x hat of lambda is equal to phi evaluated at the start of the curve, x hat lambda naught, plus the integral from lambda naught to lambda of grad phi evaluated at x hat of our integration variable, which I'll call lambda prime, dot the derivative of x hat, our curve parameterization, with respect to our integration variable, lambda prime, d lambda prime. <coughs> So all that this is saying is that the, uh, the value of phi at any point along the curve is equal to its start value plus the integral of its derivative along the curve, <coughs> which comes as no surprise to anyone, I'm sure provided all of those things are uh, well-defined. And we have the same thing for a vector. So V at any point along the curve is equal to V at the start of the curve plus the integral okay well now this grad V is a tensor and it simply acts on it's not dotted with the uh, 
derivative of our position with respect to our integration variable. So that's a um, not unit tangent unless it has unit magnitude, but it's a tangent to the curve. I'm talking about this vector here, right? It's not a unit tangent unless the uh, unless it has magnitude of one, but you don't necessarily have to parameterize it by arc length. So <clears throat> it's definitely in the tangent direction, but not necessarily of unit magnitude. All right. Well, if the curve is closed, then phi and v of lambda naught have to equal phi and v of lambda 1 since it starts and ends at the same point. Since the scalar and vector fields are single-valued, um, we have to have that phi of x of lambda 1 is equal to phi of x of lambda naught. <clears throat> and the same thing with v. No, I want the... Uh, I don't know that I actually saved any time doing that, but it was fun. <clears throat> All right, so if that's the case, then if we go back up here, um, when we integrate these from lambda naught to lambda 1, they'd better integrate to 0. So integral lambda naught to 1, grad phi dot derivative of x with respect to our integration variable is equal to scalar 0. And likewise, we'll have a vector 0 for the uh, <coughs> gradient of v1. Kind of like that trick, huh? Well, apart from the fact that it moves it when you're trying to copy it. But. Hey, nope. All right, so that's for the parameterized curve. Well, then it kind of holds also for just the curve itself without any parameterization. So um, the integral, yeah, we'll start that on the next page. So the integral over any closed curve C I think often you'll see that, right, a line integral if you take some other classes, like anything that does potential flow, they talk about that a lot. Um, grad phi dot dx vector is equal to scalar 0, the line integral over a closed curve of grad 
v acting on dx is equal to vector 0 for a closed curve C. with phi and v differentiable. <coughs> All right, so next will be Stokes's theorem. And there are three relations that we'll call Stokes' theorem here. They all involve uh, the curl of vector fields. Well, not all of them. One of them involves a cross product, but they're all related to basically how vector fields swirl um, as opposed to divergence. So let phi, v, and t be differentiable scalar vector and tensor fields. defined on a region R then given any positively oriented surface S in R that has boundary C a closed curve will have three relations So we have first uh, the integral over C of phi dx is equal to the integral over the surface of n hat, the unit normal, cross grad phi dA and 2 the line integral around the closed curve of any vector field V dot the tangent differential vector there is equal to the integral over S of n dot curl V dA Oh, that should not have, yeah, that's not a vector there, that's a scalar area, the vector's there. All right, and finally, the line integral of the action of a tensor on the differential tangent vector 
is equal to the integral over s of the transpose of the curl of t acting on an dA. <clears throat> In, you know, graduate level math stuff, they would call all of the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem stuff that we just said here, those are all special cases of what they would call Stokes theorem. So the, uh, the one that works for all of them is the integral over a region of the exterior derivative of a differential form is equal to the integral over the boundary of that differential form. But we don't know about exterior derivatives or differential forms. Um, so we kind of have to look at all of the special cases. Um, but they all come from the same thing. The proof of any version of Stokes' theorem is based on breaking the region up into tiny subregions and then summing the integrals over each. So we're not going to formally prove it, but we'll at least give you an idea of how Stokes' theorem gets proven so that it doesn't seem like a magic black box of voodoo that you just kind of have to invoke. to we'll call it tiny subregions and summing the integrals over each. <coughs> So I'll give you a two-dimensional picture of it um, because it's a lot less trouble to draw two-dimensional pictures. But of course, the same process and arguments apply to the three-dimensional case. So let's say that R is just kind of this box. So here's R. And here's the boundary of R. All right, so let's say that we break it up into a bunch of smaller boxes. So maybe that's 
T one T two You get the idea. <clears throat> All right. So R is equal to the union I going from 1 to N of all of those TIs. <clears throat> all right. Well, if we look at, say, T1 and T2, Yeah, we'll draw those four, actually. Then, um, you know, these ones, these faces here, are all dr. You know, they're, they're on... the actual boundary of R, whereas um, these are all interior faces, whoopsies, there we are. All right, so if you think about integrating something over all of R, then you would just sum the integrals over the volumes of each of the individual <coughs> contributors here. Well, it turns out to also be the case, you know, if you wanted to integrate something over the boundary of R, something that acts on the, uh, the normal direction, then, for instance, phi times n, um, well, all the interior faces would cancel out, right? Because the unit normal to T1 points from T1 to T2, but the unit normal from T2 on this face here points from T2 to T1, and phi would have the same value. So whatever contribution the integral on, uh, on T1 was, on this face would get canceled out when you go to integrate the same thing on T2 over that face. So, you know, it's kind of trivial for the volume case that the integral over R is the sum of the integral of over all the T's, but it also so happens that the integral over the boundary of R is equal to the sum of all of the boundary inter integrals because all the internal face contributions cancel out. So we have that the integral over the boundary of phi n dA is equal to the sum i going from 1 to n of the integral boundary of T i phi and dA, since all the internal face contributions cancel out. You know, and, and of course, it's also the case that the integral over R of, say, any old G dV is equal to the sum of the integral over each of the little blocks there. All right, so if we consider an infinitesimal, we'll call it volume element, but it's in 
two dimensions, you know, so we'll call it like a little infinitesimal square. Um, it's pretty easy to show. Stokes theorem applies to that. So we'll talk about the divergence theorem here. We're going to relate the integral over the surface of phi and dA to the integral over the volume of the gradient. We'll say the integral over dB phi n dA is equal to for an infinitesimal element b. So for the sake of argument, let's make B a really small square aligned with the X and Y axes, and we'll do it in two dimensions to make it faster. Um, but the exact same argument would, of course, apply to a three-dimensional one. You just have a cube or a rectangular prism, I suppose. We're actually making it a rectangle. All right, so we'll draw our B. Then we'll number its faces, one, two, three, four. And it has width delta x and height delta y. So here we're saying that it's all aligned with the coordinate axes. So the unit normal on 1 is minus EX. Minus EX. The unit normal on 2 is equal to EY. On 3 it's plus EX. And on face four, it is minus EY. All right, so let's say the integral over the boundary of B phi and DA, well, if it's infinitesimal, then we have that's equal to, oh, and we'll say that um, let phi naught be the value at the center. All right, well then the <coughs> value of phi on face 1 is going to be phi naught minus delta x over 2 d phi dx delta y if you integrate it right because your area is going to be delta y and your because that's the width of face 1 right it is delta y wide and your unit normal is in that way minus ex so that'll be phi naught minus, that should be a delta x over 2. Partial phi, partial x, delta y. 
minus EX and then we'll add on the contribution from phase 2 phi naught plus delta Y over 2 partial phi partial Y well the width of that face is delta X and it's normal is EY plus phi naught plus delta x over 2, so this is for phase 3. And finally for phase 4, minus All right, well, we can add all of those together. This is equal to delta x, delta y, partial phi, partial x, plus phi naught minus phi naught, so those cancel out. EX plus the same thing. Partial phi, partial Y. All right, so that is equal to delta X delta y grad phi, which we can identify as the integral over b grad phi dv. So basically, the proof proceeds by arguing that at least as you break r into smaller and smaller boxes, um, we have to have as our boxes grow small. When you sum them all up, the interior faces cancel. So So the sum i going from 1 to n over the boundary of phi n dA is always equal to the sum, or rather just the integral over the boundary of all of r of phi and dA. This is regardless of how small the boxes are, just because the interior faces cancel. Um, and that is, you know, at least going to, as they get small, that goes to the sum i going from 1 to n. So, of course, n is going to increase as these get small. B i. <clears throat> grad phi dv, which is always equal to the integral over r of grad phi dv. 
So that's essentially how the proof for Stokes' theorem proceeds. There's some arguments about, like, oh, well, as we make the boxes smaller and smaller, how do you make sure that the error goes away faster than the number of boxes increases? Um, but we don't really have to worry about that here because we're not trying to prove it formally. Just give you a sketch of how it's done. All right, so that's it for the integral theorems section. Let's do the last problem from exercise one in chapter four. Show this using the divergence theorem. So we want to show that the integral over the boundary, oh, wind's picking up, got to way down some of my stuff here. <clears throat> All right, so the integral over the boundary of a vector field u times some vector field v dot the unit normal dA is equal to the integral over the region u div v plus Grad u acting on v integrated over the volume. All right, this one's not bad at all. Um, so from the definition of the tensor product of two vectors, we have this boundary. That's not very good u. V dot and dA is equal to the integral over the boundary u tensor product v and dA by the definition of the tensor product. We can apply the divergence theorem to that. That's the integral over R of the divergence u tensor product v dv and then we can use the product identity in chapter 3 equation 320 that is equal to the integral over r div v u plus grad u acting on v which is it. All right, that uh, concludes today's lesson. So next we're gonna get on to kinematics and things are gonna get awful continuum mechanics see awful quick, so that's probably exciting for everyone. I know this uh, upfront graduate level algebra and uh, you know tensor calculus stuff is probably not what you're looking to get into as an engineer but unfortunately or fortunately kind of keeps us employed. Um, it's something that you need to understand at least well enough to have the rest of it all work out. All right have a good one. Catch you later.